The 82nd Texas legislative session came to a close and there was still work left to be done. We all heard about the special session being called and the myriad of issues that were to be covered. Everything from redistricting and education to sanctuary cities and TSA pat downs. Tonight we'll discuss what issues made it to the special session, which bills received the governor's signature, and what does it all mean for those of us living in the Lone Star State. I'm Ernie Manus and this is Houston 8. Joining us tonight are Charles Kuffner, political blogger, Off the Cuff. Dr. Theo Harrington, Associate Professor, Political Science, Texas Southern University. And Texas State Senator Dan Patrick, representing District 7. Before we start, remember you can share your thoughts throughout the show on Twitter using hashtag Houston8. And now we begin. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to be back. I Thank want to you. start off with Dr. Harrington and ask, explain a little bit about what is a special session. Why do we call these? A uh, special session is um, a provision that is provided by the Texas Constitution. Um, articles um, 3 and 4 provides for the governor to call a special session. And what the governor has the power to do is to convene the legislature for extraordinary circumstances that the governor would like to see the legislature address. And the governor usually can convene a legislative session uh, for 30 days and he can convene as many as he like uh, for those extraordinary circumstances. Some governors have convened up to six. Uh, Bill Clements, Governor Bill Clements in 1989 convened six sessions. Governor Perry in 2003 convened four sessions. I think six is the maximum number. But the uh, governor can convene a, a session and the session addresses the issue that the governor sets before it. Only the governor can set the agenda that goes before the special session of the legislature. Okay, so and Charles, then they, they got off good with just one session, right? Yes, they accomplished uh, what it was the governor wanted to accomplish. And as uh, the professor said, uh, in the past, the governor has, some, has called more than one in 2003 for redistricting. Um, in 2006, uh, there was uh, two special sessions to address uh, school finance. That's what led to the uh, property tax cut and the uh, business margins tax. In 2007, there was a very short one. I'm sorry, 2007 or 2009, there was a short 2009 one. 2009, the short one for, uh, couple uh, of days. for I believe it was uh, transportation, it was transportation sunsetting. So it, it just depends on the issue. Okay, Senator Patrick, was it worth it? Did we need it? I mean, I've seen things $60,000 a day yeah. spending on these things. Well, did we need it? It depends how you view it. Um, from a conservative viewpoint, uh, we were able to get things done in the special session, particularly in the area of education, that the superintendents and school boards wanted, that we weren't able to get, to get done during the regular session because in the Senate we have this rule that says you have to have 21 votes to bring a bill to the floor out of 31. That's a high bar, two-thirds threshold. In the special, we didn't have it. We only needed 16 votes, and there are 19 Republicans. So Wendy Davis, a Democrat from Fort Worth, at the end of session, filibustered the school finance bill. And I think some people are deciding was that a victory or a loss for her side because by filibustering the school finance bill, which had to pass, so our schools had money, that opened the door for a special session to do all the things that the Democrats in the Senate blocked with the 21 vote rule because mm -hmm. they, they have 12 Democrats, 11 block a bill. So did we need it? Um, from our viewpoint, the conservative viewpoint, the school administrator and the school boards, yes, because we finished up business. Um, did we, could we have gotten this all done in the regular session without the 21 vote rule, which I've been opposed for a long time? I don't think the minority of one third should have uh, tyranny over the majority, um, which our founding fathers talked about. That's why in Congress, it's a simple majority to pass and not two thirds. So uh, it depends on how you're looking at it. It was very productive, we got a lot done. Charles, well, I can tell you're like chopping simple, at the best. A simple there. majority in the House in Congress, not so much in the Senate, where, where 40 votes has been able to block right. things. Um, you know, I would argue that we were going to have a special session regardless of what happened, and for two reasons. One, at, towards the end of the regular session, uh, Governor Perry uh, stepped in and kind of put the kibosh on a deal that was working over a bill over with uh, the Texas Windstorm Insurance Agency. Um, and that was something that needed to be passed because the agency was... You know, but that could have been done in five days. Sure, it could have, but again, that, that was once, a five days but once you open the door, uh, as we saw, 
the governor can add anything he wants to it, much as he added the pat-down bill And the special the session <laughs> needs to be 30 days. If you start it, it goes 30 days, correct? You can, you can adjourn before can that. You? As we said, that uh, right. session 2009 adjourned after two or three days. Yeah. Once because you get the work done. The senators took off a day early. Well, it's not that we took off a day early. Uh, all our work was done, and there was nothing left we could do. The House, in other words, if the House passed us a bill the last day because of the time and the rules, we couldn't do anything. And so we were there working the entire session. In fact, most of the bills we got out in the first 10, 12 days, and then we just set. So the criticism of you guys leaving a day early, leaving the House only to vote yes or no, and nothing else was tying their hands, it's, not it's accurate? It's just unfounded. Be again, uh, there was nothing the House could do to send us on the last day that we could possibly get done. Dr. So, Harrington? So we were finished. It was needed also for the congressional uh, redistricting. The uh, legislature had left that unfinished, particularly uh, the uh, joint district maps. As, as Texas gained four additional uh, uh, representative uh, districts, uh, there was a need to draw those new districts as well as to uh, look at the uh, census data and draw the other uh, 32 districts. Although, yeah, just to frame although, the although argument the, for Although a there was a five-member board that could have done that. We, yes. It's not something constitutionally we not, had not to do. The, not for Congress. It's for the legis for legislative redistricting, the, the LRB. The legislative redistricting, but the congressional districting, we did not have to draw a map. Right, that could have been done to the courts, right, but I don't, I don't think anyone I don't think anyone really expected well, that. Let me just to frame this argument for the, yeah. so the audience knows that pretty much the four major things that got passed during the special session were the school financing, which we will talk about, Medicaid savings, we'll talk mm -hmm. about, redistricting, and windstorm insurance. Were right. the, and the things that we've heard so much about Sanctuary City and the TSA pat-downs didn't. Yeah. And we'll talk about those in a right. second. But go okay. back to where we were talking about the redistricting. You redistrict, and then what I read is it's going to go to the courts anyway. Uh, it will go to the courts. I was on the redistricting committee. And uh, th there's always someone who's going to sue for some reason over a map. And, uh, you know, as a member of the committee, uh, our goal was to draw a fair and legal map. I believe we drew a fair and legal map that represented the population Let of Texas. Let me ask you this. When you have a position within a party, so yeah. you have an agenda, how do you truly draw a fair and balanced map when don't you have a horse in the race? Uh, you know, you could argue that in the past, if the Democrats were in control, there was a, a bias. If the Republicans were in control, there's a bias. But... You know, you're kind of limited. First of all, they're minority protected districts that you can't do a lot with. Um, and secondly, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, we worked hard, and Chairman Seliger um, from Amarillo worked hard to do exactly that. We didn't want to draw a map that was going to be easily thrown out. What is the, what is the purpose right. of spending all those months and working on that and, and have a court um, uh, or the Department of Justice draw up a totally new map. I mean, we really wanted to draw a map that was fair and legal. We are a Republican state right now. There, I mean, there were 101 House members. There are 19 out of 31 senators and all statewide. So obviously, the district, there are going to be more Republican districts than Democrat. That's, that's kind of the way it worked out. Uh, but that's been a people's decision, not, not, our, you know, not our decision. Let me ask philosophically, Dr. Harrington, should the legislature be drawing these kind of maps? That's not unusual. Um, legislatures are drawn. Sometimes uh, there are special boards or uh, commissions that are, uh, that are re ch charged with that responsibility of drawing the districts. But legislators prefer to draw the districts. Well, That's I'm sure <laughs> they do for obvious because reasons. Because there is this interest in the incumbency protection. Usually. One of the criticisms, And, and it does reflect the will of the people. But one yes. of the criticisms that has come out of it is that the minority votes lack representation in the way the map has been drawn. Charles, is that an accurate criticism? Well, the, the criticism in particular is that the large growth in the state was driven primarily by Latinos. Um, some 87, 88 percent of the growth in the state was the result of increases in the Latino population. And the argument is that, well, there's no, you know, in the in all the maps that were drawn from the State Board of Ed, the House, the Senate, and the Congress, there's no more districts that were drawn for Latino to win. Now, I mean, that's an argument that's going to be fought out in the courts, and, and right. uh, you know, we could spend all day arguing this, but that, that's what the argument is, and that's what a lot of the lawsuits are about. But, but, but there's a big difference between the African-American community minority districts, which are protected under the Voting Rights Bill, and the Latino vote. The Latino population is spread out all across the state. Obviously, there are some areas in the state where there are pockets, but different than the African-American population that is not as scattered. I mean, in my district, 
you know, I have uh, one of the most conservative Republican districts in the state, which is West Harris County. Mm -hmm. I have a huge Latino population. So it wasn't as if you can bring all the people together and say, well, let's draw people here. You talked about gerrymandering, trying to get enough Latinos into a district. Now I realize that others disagree, but it, it's that growth of 87% is all across the state. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's but, true. But part of the argument was that um, most of that growth was in the Harris County area. And because most of that growth was in the Harris County area, perhaps one of those districts should have been targeted for the Harris County well. I mean, Harris County grew at about the same rate as the state, so Harris County wasn't going to get proportionally any more congressional uh, representation than it did. Um, really, what you know, we have the same argument in redrawing the the city of Houston. Right, council those are different districts. maps. Yeah. For our they are different maps, realize. but it was the same argument. And and the senator's correct. The Latino population is spread out, and it is, it is harder. One way you can look at it is it's a matter of what you value when you draw the maps. Uh, how much how much value to put on communities of interest, how much ma value right. do you put on compactness, how much value do you put on um, minority representation. Y you know, you can have one or two of any of these three, it's really hard to get all three in one. And, and, mm -hmm. and just to uh, close this point, my Senate district was the largest in the state. Uh, I had a million thirteen thousand people. That's several hundred thousand more than congressmen. The new districts are 811. I had to give up 203,000 people. So West Harris County is fast growth. We didn't get a new congressional seat out there. The, the new congressional seat that everyone thought, well, West Harris County will get one. It'll be a Republican conservative district. That district ended up being drawn in East Texas from Pasadena up through, mm -hmm. through some of the rural counties. And that will probably be a, a Republican seat. But Harris, it, it's, trust me, spending months on the maps, yeah. Trying to make that work and trying to make a fair and legal map is a, is a real challenge, particularly when you can't identify, well, he, here are, there, there are 811,000 in the Senate District. Here are 811,000 Latinos living in this area. Well, they, you know, they're right. everywhere. You know, yeah. they've, they've, they've moved all into all districts. To finish up on this one topic, when, will we, when do we project we'll feel this map actually taking hold? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just observe that at least in the last two rounds, um, we wound up with different districts, at least at the congressional level, for the 2006 election and for the 1996 election. So if recent history at least holds, we'll probably have some different districts, not all, a handful right. maybe, for the 2016 election. But you just don't know. I mean, we don't know what the Justice Department is going to do yet. This is the first time since the passing of the Voting Rights Act that a Democratic Justice Department has been right. in power after right. a reapportionment. We just don't know what they're going to do. Right. Okay, let's move on to school finance. Yes. Senator Patrick, take me through what we have now. Well, I was in the middle of it, being on finance, being on education, and being on uh, school finance, uh, all three of those committees in Fiscal Matters 4. Uh, the headlines that 100,000 teachers were going to be let go uh, was fear-mongering, just like closing down nursing homes. It didn't happen. Hundreds of, you know, there, there will be several thousand teachers let go. Most of those were hired with one-time stimulus money that it shouldn't have been used for. Uh, the Senate insisted on putting six billion back into education above our base budget. We prevailed. Uh, so the average school district in the state is going to get average, about 6 percent. Uh, Cy Fair, for example, is going to be average around 3 percent over the two years. Some of the districts, they were a low, a low uh, funded district. Uh, some of the districts that had more money are going to be about a 7 or 8 percent. But I think if you ask the superintendents and the school boards, they would say they received more money than they anticipated because what we did while we cut the budget 15 billion which was basically stimulus money we prioritized in the senate the money to be focused on education and so the dollars we had that's where we put the focus and and the fiscal matters bill at the end of the session which was filibustered by senator davis that's what we passed in the special session and then very quickly the other key bill is that the administrators and the school boards wanted some flexibility and we gave it to them. For example, the rule was last teacher in is the first one to be fired if you have a cutback. Now the school districts can keep the best teacher no matter what. And the second issue was uh, the Democrats pushed through a bill last session that said you can't reduce a teacher's salary by a dollar. By a dollar. So, so the school districts are coming and saying look if I could reduce my teacher salaries by one percent I could keep all my teachers. And so our argument was, let's give the school districts, and some will, some will not, the flexibility, and the teachers, maybe the unions and the associations didn't, but the rank and file teachers said, would I rather have a 1% pay cut to get through these economic times, or a 100% pay cut? Okay, a criticism so we, we that I see teachers. is that this, this bill, right. this law, is a vote against teachers, is how oh, it it's came out. No, it was a vote for teachers, and the teachers know it. 
uh, the teachers Charles, don't. Help me on this one. Well, I mean, obviously that's a subject that will be discussed quite a bit between now and November 2012. I mean, the senator's correct that the Senate put more money into education than the House did, but it's important to remember that the House would have cut about twice as much out of education than what the Senate did. So it's like the House dug a 20-foot hole and the Senate threw 10 feet of dirt back in, okay? Um, if I remember, they were expecting to lose $9.7 billion, but ended up only losing $4 billion in the special like session. Something like that. Yeah. I, I don't think, I don't think a, a 6% cut across the board is a 10-foot hole in this economy. Well, well again, that's, a, that's, that's certainly something that we can debate. I mean, what it comes down to, again, though, is that Texas is growing. We have a lot more students. 80,000 more. And what, what I think everyone will agree is that there's, there's been no mechanism to fund that growth. Um, you know, one of the results of that 2006 special session was that uh, a portion of the school districts were frozen at 2006 levels. And in the meantime, gas prices have gone up, um, electricity prices have gone up, um, costs of lots of things have gone up, and that hasn't been Is reflected it wrong in the budget. to look at it and say, we need to cut money somewhere. Things, uh, there's going to be difficult choices right. made. I, I don't think, even I wouldn't have argued that we didn't need to cut. It's a question of where. And, you know, one thing that still, still has not been addressed is the fact that that business margins tax that was created in 2006 to pay for, or to mostly pay for, there were other taxes, there was also an increase in the cigarette tax, but that was incre it created to pay for the property tax cut in 2006 hasn't done so. It's fallen short by billions of dollars. Right. And this was something that we knew about at the time, and, yeah. and that yeah. hasn't been addressed. Well, I want to let Dr. Harrington yes. jump in here. This question of education is an important one in the state of Texas. Um, if you see the polls in terms of how the citizens of Texas rank issues of importance, education is at the very top. So we know that um, to give less to education is something that the voters are looking at because the, there's this expectation that our school systems um, will need additional funds. Although the school systems got more than they anticipated, but they were initially anticipated even more. But, right. but, <laughs> in, but in fairness, Doctor, we have, we have put significant money into education for a decade above student growth and above inflation. And so you cannot continue to do that. I mean, there's only so much money, and, and the, tax, the voters are very clear. They didn't want their taxes going up. People are struggling. Businesses didn't want their taxes going up. Homeowners didn't want them. And part of the, the com what compounded the problem was education is funded by the state, usually about half, and local property taxes. Mm -hmm. and, and the school districts have been, have been used to getting a 7 to 8 or 9 percent increase in appraisal values year after year after year. Well, now they're, it's gone. So the state kind of had to backfill that. And so we picked up the local side. So when property taxes come back, over when, when the economy bounces back and home values go up, that will help the situation. In the meantime, the state has to continue to backfill that. And, and I just want to, for people who do not know, we still spend nearly half of our budget, nearly 50 cents of every dollar in the state of Texas goes to education. And we're actually spending more money in this budget than the last budget on education. Do we know how other states do? Uh, we, you know, where I, do we rank I, in? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know those numbers. But we're actually spending more money than we did last session on education, but the growth, the 80,000, we're not funding that at the same level. And, and the reason school districts, at, while the classrooms are going to be fine and the teachers are going to be fine, the reason is the school districts have had to tighten their belt and they're cutting in non-classrooms. We have over 600,000 employees in our education system in Texas, of all the school districts combined. Only half are teachers. So what we said to the superintendents and the school districts, you want flexibility? You've got to cut that 6% needs to come from out of the classroom. And, they, and I think they've done a pretty good job. I think all the superintendents in this area have done a good job of taking that cut, not out of the classroom or teachers, uh, and it may be a 1% cut or so, but they're taking it out of the non-classroom side. Charles? Well, yes, there are a lot of non-teachers in, in, uh, in the schools. Uh, a lot of them are people like school bus drivers, cafeteria sure. workers, mm -hmm. maintenance workers, but there's also a lot of people who are there because the state puts requirements and the federal government puts requirements on what the schools do with, with standardized tests and other things, and these supplemental people are there to help meet those requirements. You know, they, this didn't come out of nowhere, and as um, Thomas Ratliff, one of the board members on the State Board of Education, has pointed out, you know, the ratio of teachers to non-teachers in Texas public schools has been essentially flat for the last decade. It's not like there's been some great mm -hmm. growth in 
you know, employees who aren't teachers. Right. We've been doing this for a while because it's something that the state and federal governments mandate we do. Let me ask this question, and I'm not sure if my, my information is right on this, but with that school finance bill, there were over 400 amendments added, including stuff about border security. Is that accurate? And how do these bills get to that point? Uh, I, I don't know that there were 400 amendments in, in the... Uh, you have to remember, in the House, there are 150 members. If each member has three or four amendments, you get up there pretty high, quickly. And in the Senate, uh, we had very few amendments on our bills. There are only 31 of us. Uh, I'm not putting down the House. We right. just work differently. But I'm wondering how does something like Democrats border security well. end up in an education yeah. bill? I, uh, uh, it's because it, it was a fiscal matters bill, okay? Fiscal okay. matters covered a lot of things. So uh, how, how did the smoking ban end up in, you know, it wasn't even on the call. But because it would save $30 million was the, was the promise, that became a fiscal matter. So that's what happened. Anything that looked like it could save money could get in the fiscal matters bill. And the reason that sanctuary cities, which the House, we passed a sanctuary city bill to the House two weeks before the special session it's ended. It's like you're reading my mind. You okay. know where I want to go and next. It, and, it, and they never even voted it out of committee. I mean, they sat there for two weeks. They didn't have much else to do except do that. Mm -hmm. And the last day, they wanted us to attach the sanctuary city bill to the education fiscal matters bill, part of it. And we said no, um, because we knew the Democrats would probably filibuster and kill the fiscal matter bill again, and we'd be back for another session. And we said, that's not where it belongs. You have a bill. It deals with sanctuary cities. You've had it for two weeks. Pass that bill. Don't interfere with school finance because the school districts needed certainty. They couldn't go another month into August not knowing right. how much money they had. And Charles, I think we did the, the, right the interesting thing. thing, of course, yeah. is that in the, in the regular session, the House passed the Sanctuary Cities bill pretty early on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't tell you why it why they didn't get around to this it this time. And the and reason, did we, didn't, make the reason we didn't... We do not have the right. sanctuary no. city. And the reason we didn't pass it, because it was a 21-vote rule. Because when it came to the Senate, we had 19 Republicans and 12 Democrats I mean, blocked it. I mean, if you want to look at it from, from a strictly crassly political viewpoint, you know... Now everyone, every Republican gets to say they voted for a sanctuary cities bill. The House <laughs> voted for it in the regular session. The Senate vote, got to vote for it. In that's the not that's session. not flying with the Tea Party. Let I'm me tell you what. The tea, I, the, that, any Republican that goes on and said, "I." Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, before we run out of time, and, and sanctuary cities. The one thing we did make a change: you now must prove citizenship to get a driver's license. That was part of the sanctuary city bill that was added so, to another bill. So that's so, a significant piece. So bring, bring your passport matters. to the DPS office. Yeah. And hope okay, let me, we're, we're going to run out of time before I get to this, and I want to know TSA pat downs. Yeah, you were involved in that one. I was. I, I was kind of. You involved were involved in, in a lot of this <laughs> this I, I year. Was, yeah. uh, got a lot of press yeah. all across the country. Yeah, it, the um, didn't go through, so people it, know it didn't. It did not go through. Uh, the House passed it, the first round, um, and uh, it was killed in the Senate. Uh, I brought it back, and I was waiting for, for David Simpson, a freshman member, to send his bill out again. And uh, something went on in the House. I'm not sure what it was. And so we, we passed it out of the Senate at the end. Uh, the House had a chance to pass it the last day, and they couldn't. They were a few votes short. But it is outrageous what TSA is doing in our airport terminals, that they are groping children, adults, people in wheelchairs uh, that have no reason to be suspected terrorists. And... And as I said on the Senate floor, when we teach our children and grandchildren, if an adult touches you in that area, you know, let us know. You can be a parent or a grandparent and see your child touched in areas that we tell them not to. And they say, Mommy, Daddy, you told us not to let anyone touch. It is outrageous what's happening. And outside of the value yeah. of that bill, yes. wherever you stand on it, it did not go through but yeah. got a ton of attention. And then the governor has kind of ridden that bill to quite a bit of notoriety. Right. And TSA changed their policy on children because mm -hmm. I believe the attention it brought, even though we didn't pass it. And I think they're going to change the policy on adults, too. Uh, we want secure airports. Don't, but the TSA came down and threatened Texas. We're going to close down your airport. That's where I was going to go with this. And, and uh, that's, it is unconscionable for the federal government to threaten a state. Charles, well, the, threat, the, the threat was because the, the bill was going to threaten, arre threaten arresting the TSA agents for doing what they believed to be their jobs. Wait, now, what, they were, what they believed to do their jobs would be a crime on the street. We don't let our police officers do that. You have to have probable cause or reasonable suspicion for those types of searches. And just to have an innocent person, a 95-year-old leukemia patient in a wheelchair, 
a couple of months ago. Dr. Harrington, yeah, that was, that was I am going to let you wrap this whole conversation up as we're that, running out of yeah, time. That was one of those classic areas of federalism, I think. Uh, yes. when we saw three issues uh, in, the, in the legislature where we had that classic uh, tension in terms of state and federal government. One was in the area of the health care, with the yes. health uh, care compact. And the other one was in the immigration yes. area. And I think they, uh, and the third one was clearly in the area of transportation. Yes with uh, the anti-groping bill. But that's uh, natural where we see that kind of tension between the federal government where the feds are saying that the states are trying to preempt them and the states are saying that the federal government is trying to well, I am told we are out of time uh, even though we didn't get to hit some of these. Thank you gentlemen thank you. for coming in and sharing these, thank you for having these important yes, issues you. with our audience. Thank you. Now, each week we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Simply click on the local programs bar, pick Houston 8, and you can join our online community. Read about the guests, learn more about the topic, and even watch past episodes. A programming note, next Friday on Houston 8, a look at what is causing our global climate change and are we to blame. If you have a question or comment that you would like to share on this topic, feel free to email us at Houston 8 at HoustonPBS.org. That does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manus. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week. Thank you.